Hello and good evening. Um, my name is Antilla Chingaipe and I'm a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Um, I would like to um, uh, pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people and uh, their elders, both past and present, and also like to acknowledge any elders that might be present with us tonight. Um, just to let you know, after tonight's uh, chat with Roxanne, she will be doing a signing after, and we will be taking questions from the audience later on. So if you've got any questions, just put your hand up, and someone will come to you with the mic, and yeah, we can go from there. So I have a big bio um, to you know, introduce Roxanne, and I just feel like there are not enough words that could just capture just how awesome she is. And... <laughs> <laughs> And I am having a massive fangirl moment. So if you could just help me just by really giving Roxanne a very big Melbourne welcome, please. Wow. Hello, Melbourne. <laughs> There are a lot of you tonight. Um, I, you know, when I was thinking tonight, I was like, what do I ask you? Like, what, I had all these questions, and then I saw you tw tweeting this afternoon about The Bachelorette, and I sort of thought, actually, that might be great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, first of all, tell me, your fascination with The Bachelorette, how, how did that start? Oh, I, I watch trash television. That's <laughs> what I do. In fact, my next nonfiction book is about TV. So now I call it research. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the show is so stupid. It, it, you have, it started as The Bachelor, and you have 25 women vying for this mediocre-ass man. <laughs> and I was just like, really? And they get the women so drunk every single day, and they keep them together. And it's a lot of fake tan and Lee press-on nails, and it just... What's interesting is that the host, Chris Harrison, really seems to believe in the formula and this idea that perhaps true love is achievable through this absurdity. Um, and there are a lot of helicopter dates, and who doesn't love a helicopter? Um, so I just love this idea. I mean, first of all, I, I love a fairy tale, but I love how this show is so fucked up. <laughs> and yet it's so compelling. And this season, um, The Bachelorette is the first black woman, the first person of color to ever be the object of affection on the show. And it's been on since 2002. So it's interesting. <laughs> so why do you think it's taken that long? Like, why, why do you think it's taken that long? Oh, to... white people. <laughs> <laughs> on it. I mean, come on. Um, you know, there's this, even though 17% of Americans are involved in interracial relationships, wow. I don't know how I just whipped that shit out. <laughs> but um, the general public seems, the, the, I don't know, the Hollywood seems really reluctant to put interracial relationships, particularly when black men are involved, on the screen. And so they were really resistant. And it makes perfect sense that they started with a black woman, um, because that's safer. But it's just racism mm. and this idea that black people aren't desirable and that the, the TV watching public won't support this sort of interracial relationship, but they'll believe that you can fall in love in four weeks. <laughs> it's really weird, like what kinds of disbelief we're allowed to suspend. Yeah, so what do you think that it says when we talk about, when, or when we think about representation in general, having um, a black woman being you know, the object of affection of 25 men? I think it's fantastic. It's a step in the right direction. And, you know, it's weird. It's an awkward place as a feminist to be in because we, wor <laughs> we you know, we, s we work against objectification. Uh, and here we are celebrating the objectification of a woman. And you also have to look at the fact that she's thin and she's mm. traditionally beautiful. Um, it's not just any black woman. She's a lawyer and she went to prestigious schools. So she is the cream of the crop while any old raggedy ass motherfucker can be like <laughs> a, a normal contestant on the show. Um, <laughs> but it's a step in the right direction and it starts to show people that black women are marriage material and that we're more than mammies or hottentots. Hmm. So do you think that the bar was set pretty high for her as a bachelorette than if she was white? Oh, absolutely. White women can be any old thing. They don't have to have a job. They don't have to have gone to college. Um, and 
this woman has to be fucking exceptional. And that's the way it always is um, as a black person. To be the first, you have to be the best. And then you have to stay the best. It's a lot of pressure. Mm. But Rachel, um, you know, she's charming. I, she seems really likable. And I'm excited for her <laughs> to deal with all this mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any favorites so far? Like, have you seen any of the men that are I have. I actually got a screener yep. because I had to write about it um, for Marie Claire. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm going to be all the way on the other side of the world. And they were like, don't worry. We've got this. And I was like, there's no way they're going to give you a screener. But they did. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually watched the episode a couple nights ago. And um, I like Kenny, who's a professional wrestler and single father. Um, <laughs> they always also, the men always have these ridiculous um, job titles, pharmaceutical rep, uh, aspiring drummer. Um, I wish I was making that up. Oh, last, last year there was an aspiring uh, dolphin trainer. <laughs> True story. Um, so I like Kenny, uh, and she gave the first impression rose to Brian, this Colombian guy, but he chew kisses, which is to say he looks like he's cannibalizing her when he kisses her. <laughs> he, he went in for a kiss on the first night, like the day, like 30 seconds after he met her, he was like, Argh. and I was just like, oh my God, leave some of her face, come on. Oh, trauma. <laughs> um one of your other tweets this afternoon was about Australian television. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm, yes. I'm very curious, um, just your first impressions of, of what we have to offer. <laughs> I thought this last time too, but y'all's television is dry. It's just <laughs> so bad. And I don't know. I, part of it, I think, is that in the United States, we have an absurd number of channels. Like, I have four... <laughs> I have 400 channels Wow! <laughs> in my cable package. It's really embarrassing. I'm not proud. Um, <laughs> but it, that's 400 channels of stupidity, and I love it. And here there are like five channels. I'm like, what <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> How are we still watching Everybody Loves Raymond? It's just, <laughs> we can do better. There's better out there for you. But I'm really into this show now called Home Rules. Is that what it's called? Yes, and um, the episode I saw... Is it an saw, Australian show? Yeah, it's an Australian show. It's like these different couples renovate different rooms in a house. Oh, right. Uh, house Rules. It's called House Rules. And it's, it's really bad, but I like it. <laughs> I like it. So from your observations of Australian television, what does it tell you about our own makeup? Like, do you get a sense of what Australia is like by watching TV? A very yeah. white country. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, too, um, your commercials are incredibly sexist, and I say that coming from a country where the commercials are incredibly sexist, but wow, you guys are like 30 years behind. <laughs> it's really weird. I saw this commercial about, um, I almost Snapchatted it because it was, she'll be happy with if you bring home this, but she'll be mad when you find out she, when she finds out you spent $2.99. It was a commercial for Aldi. The grocery store, and it was about chocolate. And he, uh, yeah, it was about bring her, bring her this chocolate and win her heart. But then she'll find out you spent two ninety nine, and you'll be in the doghouse. Like really? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best you can do to sell this shitty chocolate? Mm. Um, but it's really interesting to see just the shocking whiteness of your newscasters and the people who get to appear on the shows. It's it's. Uh, shocking. Mm. And that's, I think, a conversation that's only started happening in the last couple of years in this country around diversity and representation and mm -hmm. the importance of it. And I guess I'm curious to know from your perspective, obviously, in America where, you know, you are having these conversations and engaging with them, just why that is important, having that sort of representation on, on screens. It's so important and it, it seems trivial, but it's not because you take it for granted. When you turn on the television, you see people that look like you and whose lives in one way or another, mirror your own. But for people of color in the United States, here in Australia, uh, I was just in New Zealand, people of color do not see themselves. And so it's almost as if you're erased from discourse and from the public sphere. And it creates this void of empathy because if nobody sees you and sees something of what your life might be like, they don't really believe that you exist or that your existence matters. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's why it matters that 
people should be equally represented, not only in pop culture, but in government and in education um, and, and everywhere. It just really matters. Mm. And it does so much for people to see themselves. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, Vanessa Williams became the first Miss America who was black. And that was the first time I believed that I could be beautiful. And you know, that's why it matters. It still matters. And it's sad that we're having the very same conversations today that we were having 30 years ago and 50 years ago. Uh, progress is really slow in this regard. Mm. And I'm, I guess I'm also very curious about how you reconcile your identities, you know, your, your, womanhood, and, your womanhood and your race. And mm -hmm. um, when you were talking just then, I was recalling that essay that you wrote about um, Nate Parker and Birth mm -hmm. of the Nation. For those that don't know, um, it was a, a movie that he, he wrote, directed about Nat Turner, who mm -hmm. led a rebellion in the United States, African-American. And it was very, it was a highly acclaimed film when it came out, a lot of buzz around it. Um, but it was quite problematic in the nature in that he had been accused of rape, I think it was 17 years prior. And you wrote this very powerful essay where you said that you could not separate yourself, your womanhood rather, from, from that and, and the fact that this, this, this victim had endured this, despite, despite the fact that a lot of African Americans believed that that story needed to be told and that representation was very important. So how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile all those things? You know, one, one day at a time and one issue at a time. When Birth of a Nation started getting buzz, I was really interested because Nate Parker is incredibly talented. Um, and then when it came out that he and his friend had been involved in a gang rape situation in college, I just thought, I'm not going to support this movie just because it tells a story about black history. Uh, and people were like, oh, no, we have to support it. This is the only way Nat Turner's story is going to be told, as if books don't exist. Um, Nat Turner has been written about extensively, and there will be more movies, thankfully, about him. And I hate when we're asked to separate ourselves and parcel it out, but I'm a human being first, and I decided to value that woman's dignity over Nate Parker's career. Nate Parker should have had better judgment, and yes, he was 19, and people should be allowed to move on from their mistakes, but this case was so sordid in every single way, and I personally, given I think a lot of my own history, I just couldn't live with it, and so, I just chose my humanity over this idea of the greater good of representation. And how was that received? I mean, did you get any backlash from within the black community? I got a lot of backlash, but the backlash came only from black men, of course, right. um, which was not surprising because, I don't know, black men oftentimes think that black women are working against them when I can't think of a black woman who isn't down for a black man at all times. Um, but they felt betrayed, and they started digging up all this work I had written um, about interracial dating. Ooh. <laughs> you found me. <laughs> I've dated white people. Oh, my God. And they thought they were saying something about me, but quite honestly, they were saying something about themselves. Mm. Um, it, I wasn't attacking a black man. I was attacking a rapist. And... Um, I'm very fine with that, and I have no regrets. Mm. I would do it again. I would say it to his face. <laughs> um, sexual violence is one of the themes that you explore in this collection of short stories, Difficult Women, which mm -hmm. is a great title, by the way. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have, have Thank you, you ever been referred to uh, as a difficult woman? Oh, all the time. In fact, I was at my parents' house in December hanging out, and my dad wanted us all to go golfing. It's a thing. <laughs> My parents live on a golf course, and I was like, oh, Dad, I'm not in the mood. And he was like, you know, Oksan, you are a difficult woman. <laughs> Just like your book, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, ha you goddamn right. Uh, so I, I've been called a difficult woman many a time. I wear it proudly. So why, why did you think it was necessary for you to title your, your, your book after that phrase? I was thinking about the women in this collection and how women are oftentimes labeled difficult whenever we make choices that men don't appreciate and that don't suit men's best interests or what they feel are their best interests. Um, and so I, I was, it was partly tongue-in-cheek in the same way bad feminist was tongue-in-cheek. And it was 
also just, I felt like really accurate. Like these are difficult women, but I celebrate their difficulties. I, I read somewhere that um, you actually wrote most of these stories before Bad Feminist and oh, yeah. Untamed State. This is one of my, this is some of my oldest writing. Um, it was the very first book my agent and I ever tried to sell. And actually two agents tried to sell this book. And editors would respond and say, you know, we love the writing. This is really great, but it makes me want to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> What's the problem? And I was not going to change a single word. And so I didn't. And so we shelved it. And finally, I sold enough books that a publisher was like, yeah, we'll take a chance. And turns out it's like, the, so far, it's my best-selling book, except for Bad Feminist. So I'm, I'm very happy that we stayed the course and waited. It's also just hard to sell short stories. Mm. I'm curious to know what was going on in your life at that time. Where were you? What I was, was in grad school, yeah. actually. I was getting my PhD. And um, I wrote more fiction during my grad school years than I think I had in any other, at any other point in my life because my grad school work is in rhetoric and technical communication, and so it was very theoretical and very technical, and fiction was my escape. And I was also living in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which is 10 hours north of Detroit and very isolated, very few people of color, let alone black people. And so I, writing was my refuge, and so I wrote all these stories, and um, it was my coping mechanism. Mm. One of my favourite stories in, in, in the book uh, is North Country, about yes. the um, black female engineer, and that resonated to me in the sense that I, I found myself in environments where, you know, you are mostly around men and you are that, that line that's being crossed between professional and unprofessional, mm -hmm. and how do you navigate that? And I found that quite interesting in how you explored it in that particular story. Yeah. Um, I got my PhD at a school called Michigan Technological University, and it's 77% male. It's a predominantly engineering institution. And it was so interesting to see, like for the first time in my life, I was the belle of the ball, and <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and I noticed how women at all levels were constantly pursued by men, and in really frustrating ways at times. Sometimes it was lovely, but other, other times it was really just like... I'm a professional, I'm here working. Why mm. are you in my lab? Mm. And so that became part of the story of this woman who's an engineer and she's just there to do a postdoc and all these men are continually hounding her, but she still manages to find love with a good guy. <laughs> um, we had a similar incident, I think, in the last week here in Australia where there's a broadcaster by the name of John Laws. You don't need to Google him. Okay. Um, and he, he sort of sparked some controversy when he, you know, he said that he wanted women to wear skirts when they worked around him. Oh, so that he could see their, you know, <laughs> No, really, it did happen. It happened this week? Last week. Like, genuinely happened. And to make it even more interesting, um, there were some very prominent uh, women that defended him and said that, you know, it was just a, 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 a blokey thing to do. And, mm -hmm. um, and you see what the patriarchy does to women? Mm. It makes them work <laughs> against their own interests. And, and I, I, I thought it was, it was quite interesting, especially obviously after reading North Country and that idea that you know, when women enter workspaces, what you have to tolerate, what you have to put up mm -hmm. with. Um, and for me, it doesn't feel like we're actually moving any, any, anywhere close to progress in that sense. I don't know that we are. How old is this guy? Gosh, he's like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's, he's, he's quite old. Yeah. Okay, so he, he doesn't get an elder pass, but oh, what a pig. And he had the audacity to say that shit out loud? Is yes. he still working? Yes. Oh, come on, guys. Wow. You know, it's, it's, every time I think we've made progress, something like this kicks up, and you realize no. And... He's not alone. Mm. Um, one of, I think it was Trump who also <laughs> requires women to wear skirts if they work in the White House. It's, so just so you know, mm. uh, it's not just your men. <laughs> <laughs> it's all men. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what it's going to take, but I think part of it is that 
you know, women are put in really difficult positions in the workplace because you, you need the job generally. Mm -hmm. And so you have to play along to get along and to just survive the workplace. But all too often playing along means that you're betraying yourself, let alone womanhood. You're just betraying yourself. And so I'm not at all surprised that women were like, oh yeah, we're gonna wear skirts so this 80 year old asshole can fucking look at some bare leg once in a while. It's the only chance he's gonna get. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also appalling mm -hmm. that women would say that. I think wear what you wanna wear, but you shouldn't wear it simply because this guy prefers it. I mean, he's just a newscaster, calm down. Mm. It, it's hard, but I think women make these choices every single day. Yeah. Speaking of Trump, Mm. <laughs> first, <Who>? of all, <laughs> first of all, um, oh, wait, wait, pause. Did everybody see the video of Melania swiping yeah. his crusty ass hand away? <laughs> okay, I'm so excited. I keep watching it on a loop. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Melania, but girl, yes, every time. Just like, get your crusty hand away. <laughs> She, you, I mean, the contempt in that, that was like her soul. Her soul was saying, don't even breathe on me. <laughs> He's never having sex with her again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just that side in itself is just not it was, something you want to have. I mean, just... <laughs> And then she kept stomping her heels into that red carpet as if to say, you are beneath my heel <laughs> with every step. Okay. Gosh. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> um, did that election result surprise you? Yes. I was stunned. I'm still actually surprised. I shouldn't be. I should not be. I should... I should have known racism was really as bad as it is, but I like to live in denial. I like to believe that things are gonna get better. I like to believe that change is happening because it seems like th things are changing. And then Trump gets elected and you realize things are way worse than I thought. Um, so I was really surprised because part of me still believes in meritocracy and I'm ashamed of that. But Hillary was so qualified and Trump isn't qualified to do a goddamn thing. And you know, how does this work that the better candidate loses? I, I mean, I'm stunned. Do you think that um, perhaps his win was, um, I guess raises some questions about the failures of feminism to sort of cut through to the mainstream in that, in that sense? No, I don't think it's about the failures of feminism. I think it's about the success of misogyny. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it, it was. I mean, one of the things that I I, I sort of uh, when I was thinking about it, I was uh, um, as a journalist. Obviously, there were the numbers and there were the, the demographics that voted. And what I found was quite interesting were the number of white women that voted for Trump, mm -hmm. uh, educated, middle class. Yes, um, I found that figure to be quite astounding because they voted in the majority. They did. When I when the numbers came out. <sighs> I just wanted to look at every single white woman and say, how could you? 53%, really? But again, it's like this, it's the very same thing as those women saying, yes, we'll wear skirts and you know, make you happy, dude. Um, I think that white women who voted for Donald Trump were more invested in protecting their whiteness than they were mm. in voting for a more qualified candidate that would probably serve their interests more effectively. Um, and I think a lot of them were unwilling to fall out of favor with men. Mm. You see women make this decision a lot where they would rather be in the good graces of men than help empower women. Mm. And uh, you have to understand where that comes from. It comes from growing up and living in a patriarchal culture. So I have empathy for that even though it also fills me with rage. Do you think that perhaps a lot of us as feminists had too much of an expectation that Hillary was going to be um, that candidate that perhaps uh, espoused a lot of those principles and perhaps didn't quite Yes, that? that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think a lot of us who are feminists really believe, again, like this idea of the greater good, mm -hmm. that 
finally the glass ceiling would be broken. She believed it too. Um, and I, I think that we thought the greater good would overcome the emails and the false narrative around the emails and the sort of cultural resistance that many Americans have to her. Uh, and we were wrong. Do you think that when, when we do think about people that are holding office, I mean, a lot of the, 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 the language and the movement around Hillary was very much about her identity as being female mm -hmm. and not so much about the feminist politics. Do you mm -hmm. think that perhaps when we are thinking about those that are holding those offices, it doesn't matter if they're male or female, but what their politics around feminism are, should we be perhaps investing in that more? We should, but I, I think that... Hillary's feminist politics were clear and her policies were clear, but she rarely got an opportunity to talk about them because people were so busy focused on surface nonsense. Mm. And I, I think that we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard the next time a qualified woman comes through um, to run for president of the United States or he, the prime minister of Australia or any a country, you know. We have to find ways to have the necessary conversations about what her feminist politics are um, because she had some really good programs, social programs that I think would have benefited a great many people and she never got to talk about them. And, you know, the critique of her campaign has been exhausting and ongoing, but one of the key things I do think that she did wrong was not doing more to bring attention to her policies. Mm. Uh, because, you know, Bernie Sanders shouted out every goddamn idea he had, even though there was no, like, basis for how to make these things into actual legislation and actual programs that would serve people. But they were great ideas. I mean, I, too, want a $15 minimum wage and free college for everyone. But, dude, how are you going to pay for it? <laughs> Um, Hillary actually had plans for how to make many of these things happen. Mm -hmm. And they were all on her website. And that seems to be where they stayed. And it's really frustrating. It was, I don't know what that campaign was thinking, but I also think that they were so overwhelmed by the narrative about the speeches with Goldman Sachs and the other banks and the narrative surrounding the emails that they were constantly just throwing water out of the boat to keep it afloat, mm. even though she was the right, you know, not, she, for me, she was the right candidate. So how do you make sense of Ivanka Trump? Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't make sense of Ivanka Trump. She's a, a rich man's daughter. But when she is out publicly, I think she was in Saudi Arabia recently with her father and um, had this fund created to empower women. Yeah, um, she got $100 million. Can you believe that shit? <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't even get 10. What the fuck? <laughs> um, but when you have that, you know, her and the books that she's writing now about empowering women and the fact that she even uses the term feminist, she called, describes herself as a feminist, uh, how, I mean, how do you make sense of that? I, I think she's a capitalist and a delusional freak. Uh, <laughs> I call myself a superhero. It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> yep. uh, you know, I, I, I am not the feminism police, and so if she wants to call herself a feminist, whatever. But I think actions speak louder than words, and I'm more interested in how she behaves as a feminist. And women who have worked with her have talked about how they ha she makes it really hard for them to get maternity leave. And most of the things she does do not serve women in any way, shape, or form unless they're exactly like her, which is to say white, traditionally beautiful, and wealthy. Um, so I, I think that she is a con artist of the highest order. She's a devil in a blue dress. And she's one of the more dangerous people because her father's a buffoon. And he can't help but fuck up. Like, that's what he does. And he's not even going to make it four years. But she's smart. She, she's her mother's child. And um, she's dangerous because she makes women believe like, that if you follow her bullshit advice, that you too will live an Ivanka-like lifestyle. Mm. And she isn't at all interested in serving women. She's interested in lining her pocketbook, which mm. is her choice. But 
I think it's horrible. So what do you then make of the argument by um, this uh, writer called Jessa Crispin? I don't know if you've heard of her. Mm. She wrote, I am not a fellow. Okay. <laughs> you clearly have some feelings. Oh, thoughts I, know. About I know her. But she, she, she argues that um, fe you know, contemporary feminism has lost its way because she sort of thinks lifestyle feminism has taken over. <laughs> she has lots of ideas about feminism. Um, <laughs> You know, what's interesting is that Jessa published several of the essays in Bad Feminist right. on her website, Bookslet. Right. And so her current, um, her current interest in being contrarian about feminism is very interesting to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think she has some very good arguments. I do. But I also think that I have personally grown weary of this genre of critiquing feminism as sport. I'm really more interested in like, let's do some of the work of feminism. Like who cares about lifestyle feminism? Let it be, so what? A woman wears a goddamn t-shirt that says feminist on it. The world continues to turn. It is really okay. Um, it, and oftentimes that's a gateway for people. Mm. And I, I don't want to do anything to discourage women from coming to feminism, however they come to it. Right. I mean, in a perfect world, we all come very purely to feminism. And, you know, we hang out in our Birkenstocks and <laughs> eat some fucking vegan food and <laughs> just think about Mother Earth. But <laughs> for those of us who can't come down that very gilded path, um, there should be, you know, uh, it should be okay yeah. to look at lifestyle feminism. You know, the real issue is that while we're sitting around discussing, like, who's doing feminism well and which feminism matters or not, there are women who aren't getting equal pay. Um, there are women who are mired in poverty, who aren't having the necessary access to reproductive freedom. Uh, who continue to live lives marked by violence, and that's more where my interest lies mm. than sitting around worrying about how well people are doing feminism. Do you think then that perhaps we could or should rather celebrate women that are in the front lines in those areas, that are actually doing the work, whether it's working with women in domestic violence situations, for example, yeah. should we have those women as the heroes of feminism in that sense rather than perhaps celebrities? That oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, but the, you know, asking feminism to be above celebrity culture, you know, why are we always expected to be perfect and to do the best possible thing? Everyone in our culture needs to focus more on people doing actually interesting and valuable work than celebrities. It's not just a feminism problem, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think celebrity culture has infected everything. Um, but I also think that celebrities can do a lot of good toward feminist goals. I think it's a gateway. I think Beyonce has done more for feminism in the past five years than almost anyone, just because she has made young people feel like it's okay to claim feminism. Mm. And that helps. It's sad that that's what it takes, but that's what it takes for many people. So what we need to figure out is, how do we take these people who come to feminism through Beyonce or Taylor Swift or <laughs> um, that other one, Hermione Granger. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Emma, what's her, Emma, Emma Watson, Watson yep. um, who I like. I, I, I don't know her, but I, I mean, she's cute. Um, but how do we teach them about the women who are you know, doing the community work and the community organizing and who are leading the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, other things like that. How do we translate that? And then how do we get them involved in community organizations themselves so that they can start to participate in the feminist project? Um, and I don't we, don't, we don't have the answer to that question yet, but I think that's where our attention should be. Yeah. Do you think that we perhaps aren't having enough public dialogue around feminism? Like... I think we're getting better about it. I think there could be more public dialogue. But again, it's a question we have to stop just asking what is feminism. Like, I no mm. longer answer that question. When a reporter asks me, I just say no. And I, I, I come off like a bitch, but that's fucking fine because you have Google. Mm. Uh, stop asking me what fucking feminism is. 
Um, or read my book. <laughs> you have a range of options for defining feminism for yourself. Um, I just think, again, we have to have more nuanced conversations. We have to stop. We're just in the same place now that, again, that we were 30 years ago. And oftentimes when I do events, older women who were active in feminism during the 50s, 60s, 70s come to me and say, I can't believe we're having the same conversation now. Mm. I can't believe it either, ma'am. I agree. Um, and so we do need to have more feminist dialogues, but I, I want to see just more policy-based dialogues and di conversations about, you know, what do we do? Because I think so many of us are just wondering, like, what do we do? How do we start? Where do we jump in? Um, and if we could talk about that and give people the tools to participate in, in community organizing and just community-based work, I think it would go a very, very long way. Mm. I have a follow-up question, but I want to go back to Beyonce. Yeah, me too. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because I She's going to have a baby soon. I know. Two babies. I know. <laughs> push, push. <laughs> um, what, what did you think when she... Um, put out that image on Instagram of her, you know, with a pregnant belly and just... And the ugly flowers and yeah. the, the red underwear. <laughs> yeah. I was like, girl, <laughs> you are so famous. <laughs> Straight up, she has reached a level of fame where she can do whatever the fuck she wants. See also her Grammy performance. What on earth when she... Oh, she was just pulling up all the Orishas and all these women were there and she barely sang. She sang for one minute of a six minute segment. The rest of it was her reciting poetry. And I, on national television, I was just like, yes. You are so famous. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was beautiful. What, what did you think about some of the criticism? Because a lot of think pieces were written around Oh, that yeah, time. a lot of white women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did you think about that? About the, the fact that the he or she was with, with yeah. her pregnant? I thought it was horrifying that mm. white women were, you know, there was uh, one woman, I think it was for the New York Post, wrote a piece about how um, not all pregnant women get to look like Beyonce or Serena Williams, because Serena also posted a lovely picture of her with her baby belly. And like criticizing these women for like for what for being awesome? <laughs> like no, not all pregnant women look the same. But it's on you if you feel like they're setting a standard. Mm. I thought she was being really absurdly critiqued for just celebrating herself. I mean, she was feeling herself, and God, we should all have that kind of self confidence. Because like I was just like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> how do I? <laughs> you know, put a flower crown on my head. <laughs> I mean, and the funny thing about those pictures is that they were hideous. Like, just the, the color composition, all of it was wrong. And yet, I did look at them and save them <laughs> to continue looking at. I, the criticism was, I felt, very unjustified. And, but, you know, part of it is that when you're in the public eye, people are going to scrutinize you. But I, I, I felt like she was being scrutinized um, because she was daring to challenge what we publicly think of pregnancy and how pregnant women should behave. Because mm. when, when I saw that, I, I, I just thought about your earlier remarks about the, the black bachelorette and this idea of who can be desirable and mm -hmm. who's... And, and when I... The, for me, the reaction to Beyonce and Serena Williams was very much, you know, I cannot recall in my lifetime seeing famous black women being pregnant um, I can't and either. being out there, and it's like a beautiful thing. It is. And normally when black women are pregnant, they're criticized. Yeah. And so I thought it was glorious. And, you know, white women have done this for years. Demi Moore, I think it was Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. Heidi Klum has done it. In fact, most celebrity women have done it on major magazine covers. Beyonce took her shit to Instagram <laughs> because she doesn't need the magazine. And people were like, ah! <laughs> Like, let Beyonce be Beyonce. <laughs> also, the way she dressed, I mean, she is a trip. I, I just, <laughs> I love her. There's, just do not slander her to me. When she wore that silky gold lame, barely there outfit at the Grammys, again showing off her belly, I was just like, do it. Just <laughs> let it all out. <laughs> Here for it. And then, 
Adele had the audacity to say, I wish you were my mommy. Mm. Adele. <laughs> I love Adele. I love her. I've been to her concert. I think she's brilliant. But this is another reason why the black bachelorette matters, because mm. we are not your mammies. Like, I don't look at Beyonce and think, mommy. <laughs> at least not in a sex, not, not in a maternal way. Mm. <laughs> 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 More in a let's have sex right now. <laughs> like, I would put a baby in Beyonce. I love her that much that I feel like if we made love, she would carry the chubbiest, beautifulest brown baby ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally sober, too. <laughs> um, Another celebrity that I, I've, I've noticed you have a fascination with on Twitter is Kim Kardashian. I've noticed how you're, <laughs> you're, you're amazed by her inability to do anything and still be famous. She's so boring. <laughs> I follow Kim Kardashian on Snapchat, and all she does is pose in the mirror and try clothes on and like show off all the shit she gets for free in the mail. And I just think, how do you not kill yourself? <laughs> like, it just seems so horrible. Her existence seems... I would die from the boredom. And then she, I look at her and I always think she's beautiful and I'm fascinated by her business savvy, but then she starts to talk. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, shh. <laughs> but also, have you noticed how slick her hair is? Yeah, I have noticed. I mean, whatever product she uses, like Kanye P or, <laughs> oh, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's magical. And it keeps that shit sleek. <laughs> I am impressed. Do you, are you, do you ever get concerned when you see um, women aspiring to be like Kim Kardashian? I do. Um, but I understand why. I mean, I aspire to be like Beyonce. So, I mean, we each have our heroes. Mm. What concerns me, though, is that they don't understand the amount of time and effort that goes into the production of Kim Kardashian. One of the things you'll notice in many of her pictures is that she's surrounded by people who are doing her hair and makeup at all times. And so I, I think that young women in particular just need a realistic sense of what it takes to look like Kim Kardashian. She works out twice a day. Uh, it's not magical. And um, all she does is be Kim Kardashian. That's literally her job. And she's actually quite open about that, which I respect. She makes it clear, like, her job is to be beautiful and to wear pretty clothes and uh, to sell nonsense. Um, and so I, I just wish young people had a more realistic sense of what it is that they, were, that they were trying to reach toward, that it's not realistic unless you invest that kind of time and money. Mm. And... But um, when you've got yeah. things like social media, Instagram, and, and it, it's selling itself as real, mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how, do you, how do young people break through that? Like, how do they, um, you know, aspire for anything more than what they're seeing if that's what's considered popular? Yeah. And I think it goes to, we have to teach media literacy and make mm -hmm. sure people understand that when you are looking at someone's life on Instagram or Snapchat or uh, Facebook, you're seeing a very curated sliver of someone's life. You're not seeing anything close to the whole of their life. And even on a television show like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, you're seeing a sliver of this woman's life. Um, and even the judgments I make, I am making based on seeing a sliver. Um, and so it's important to, for them to know that there is more to life than looks. There is more than li to life than posting whatever it is that you're doing to social media. But you need to have a passion figure out what that passion is, mm. you know, and pursue it. I, I met a young man last night um, who was trying to decide what he wants to do with his life because he's currently majoring in something he doesn't care for. I think that's what he's doing. And I, he wants to pursue art. And I just like, dude, go pursue art. Have a job, but go pursue art. Like, do what you want. Do what you care about. And I, I really hope that people figure that out, that what's happening with celebrities on social media is a performance. And it's a very beautiful performance, but a performance is all it is. Mm. I could ask you a few more questions, but I think I will open it up to the audience if anyone's got any questions for Roxanne. Just put oh, your hand up and someone... Damn. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm in the middle of um, Jessica Crispin's book at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I'm a little bit past the initial stages of feminism and 
finding her book quite difficult, but sort of agreeing with her too at the same time. Mm -hmm. I suppose my question is, is really, at the end of the day, what's the difference between Ivanka, Trump, Beyonce, um, Kim Kardashian? They're all lifestyle feminists. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, but, but in terms of not actually fighting for policy, like not focusing on policy and... Like that, I agree with you in terms of the fact that policy is where we need to be looking and education. They're not, none of them are doing the work that we really need. Girl, no, you need to educate <laughs> yourself on Beyonce. <laughs> Beyonce is one of, Beyonce gives so much money to Houston, Texas, and she particularly supports housing for poor women in Houston, Texas. Beyonce has founded several scholarships for black women entering writing and the arts. So, like, she doesn't talk about it, but her work behind the scenes in terms of policy and supporting women is unparalleled. The other women are lifestyle feminists, but like beyond like the standing for Beyonce, she does actual feminist work. If you look at who she hires, it's all women. Her band, all women. Her show choreographed entirely by women. Uh, I mean, like, let's give credit where credit's due. Uh, there is no difference between Ivanka, Kim Kardashian, and everyone else. Um, you know, <laughs> they're, just, they're famous, they're wealthy, they're beautiful, and they're not really interested in sharing that wealth or um, allowing anyone else to achieve what they achieve. They purposely set the bar beyond reach, um, but Beyonce makes sure that she won't be the last Beyonce. And so that's the difference. My bad. Hi, I'm one of those uh, first-generation feminists, and <laughs> I remember in my 30s, I was so excited that roles were being blown open, and they, the stereotypical role, but uh, there, you may have talked about this in Bad Feminists, because I haven't read it, I just got it tonight, mm -hmm. but um, the thing that's so exciting to me is the revolution of gender fluidity, and the whole thing of wide open spectrum of, of gender roles, and, and that to me is the evolution of feminism, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think it's exciting and wonderful to see how gender roles are shifting. I don't think the shift is happening quickly, and I don't think it's happening broadly. I think we're seeing it in very niche and narrow ways, and it's going to take a very long time for it to gain purchase um, widely in our culture. I think, it, But I do think it's a step in the right direction, and I do think it is one of the goals of feminism is to reorient gender roles because I think our current rigidity in terms of the gender binary, not only does it harm women, it harms men. And masculinity is a very challenging container for most men to live up to. Um, so I do think that we need to flatten all of that. That said, I also think that I read an interview with someone who was talking about how we need to abandon the idea of womanhood. And I don't know that I'm interested in that per se. What I'm interested in is an acknowledgement of the gender spectrum, which is infinite, and um, also celebrating womanhood for those who identify as women anywhere on the gender spectrum. Um, because. Uh, so often we're told that woman is bad. And I would hate for us to be like, yeah, you're right, let's just discard it and do away with it forever. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering uh, at which moment in your life you fell in love with Beyonce, if you can imagine. <laughs> and yes. I'd also like to say, um, you said earlier that you want to be Beyonce and I want to be you. So. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Um, you know, I actually, I wasn't always a fan of Beyonce. When she was in Destiny's Child, I enjoyed the music, but I was just like, ugh, this corporate drone, what's happening here? I became really interested in Beyonce when she started creating solo music. And I particularly appreciate just, 
she's not perfect. I, I, I adore her, but I recognize that she's a human being with flaws, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not interested in all that. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the artistic growth. And from, to go from Destiny's Child to Lemonade, like, what? Mm. She has the range. And um, I just admire it. To see someone grow up in the public eye and be self-actualized and to take control of her career in an industry that eats women alive, I, I respect the hell out of it. And she, I also like the way she celebrates her sexuality the way she celebrates the joy of loving a black man and raising a black child. Um, these things do so much. And, you know, uh, for the young woman who asked this, the question about Beyonce as a, a lifestyle feminist, the thing is that for black women, Beyonce is so much. She celebrates her blackness so rich, richly and so deeply. And it's so rare to see a celebrity do that. There are many black celebrities who, who try not to bring attention to their blackness, but she celebrates it. And so it's when I recognized that blackness could be treated in such glory that I fell in love with her. Take one down. Um, I just wanted to know if you had uh, any comic book um, inspiration while doing World of Wakanda. Oh, absolutely. I loved working on World of Wakanda. It was so different writing a comic book from anything else I've ever done. But it was also similar. Storytelling is storytelling. Um, what, you know, for me, the inspiration was being able to write black lesbians, and specifically lesbians. Um, we don't see a lot of that. We don't see any of that, quite frankly, in comics. I'm frustrated with Marvel because they canceled the series the same way they canceled the crew. But I do think, they did say, and I do believe them, that AO, that their opportunity to write more for AO and Anika is available, and I'm going to take them up on that and hold them to that, uh, because I think that this, this story matters. And it just made me want to write more black queer women into the canon. And also, one thing I did not get to do with World of Wakanda, I would love to write fat women into comics. Uh, we just don't see that at all. And uh, it was not really, we did, I did ask for body diversity from the artist who was uh, drawing World of Wakanda. But the women are elite bodyguards. And so the reality is they can be diverse in body, but they're all going to be incredibly fit. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that was appropriate for that story. But I would love to write a story about a beautiful big woman. Hi. Um, as an aspiring writer, one thing that really inspires me about your writing, especially in Difficult Women, is the way that you sort of convey these really, really complex emotions in like a sentence, in like three words. It's mm -hmm. incredible. So I guess my question is, what, what sort of advice would you have for someone that's trying to tackle to write about something massive? Where do you start? How do you do that? I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. You know, I, it, that's a question I always ask each time I sit down to write something. And oftentimes when I'm sitting down to tackle something, I'm overwhelmed because I think I have to account for everything. And so I would say start with what interests you. And remember that you don't have to be all to end all. That you're, this, whatever piece you're working on isn't going to be the only piece on a subject. And it doesn't have to... Um, Make sure that it counts for every eventuality. Think small before you think big. And uh, that's what has helped me. Um, in most of my nonfiction, I start with an idea, a moment, um, a feeling. And then I think about, OK, how do I expand whatever I, I need to say beyond myself? How do I look outward once I've looked inward? How do I make people care about what it is that I'm interested in or invested in? <laughs> Do you find it easy to write um, fiction or non-fiction? Oh, fiction. I've been writing fiction for 38 years, I, since I was four. I've been writing non-fiction seriously since 2009. So I'm relatively new to non-fiction. Hi. Um, I, I have a question about um, this whole discussion after the Trump election about, you know, quote unquote, the failure of identity politics and how um, people in quote unquote liberal bubble need to go out and engage. But you know, I find that incredibly frustrating. Um, 
what advice do you have for somebody like me? I'll be going back to the States in a couple of months, but to engage with people who perhaps don't see me as, as deserving as a white person mm -hmm. or don't see a place for me in the country. It's just, uh, it's kind of frustrating to read all this stuff saying identity politics, but mm -hmm. in a way identity politics has been imposed on, on me. Yes. <clears throat> uh, don't engage. I, 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 I resist that entirely. I, I think it's so lazy. Uh, this idea that if we just go and hold hands with Trump voters, they'll see us as human. They're never going to see us as human. There's nothing we can do. It's respectability politics, not identity politics that's at play here. And people are saying, oh, just be good little Negroes, be good little Asians, and maybe they'll love us enough to not want to exterminate us. I mean, have people have forgotten history already? It's absurd. Uh, I, I think it's super lazy to dismiss what happened in 2016 as the identity politics. And the phrase identity politics is always used to accuse people who are different and who acknowledge that they are different and that they see the world differently, that they are treated in the world differently. Um, and I think we have to push back. And so um, I live in Indiana, at least part time, but um, that's new. I've lived in the Midwest for most of my life. I have lived amongst the Trump voters. My next door neighbors now are Trump voters. Um, and they're normal people, good people for the most part, and they're also deeply racist. I know that. And I don't know that there's anything I can do to change their mind. Um, and so I don't try. I don't think that we are the problem. Um, and so I refuse to act like it. Mm -hmm. Hi there, um, my name's Amy and I'm a teacher and an aspiring dolphin trainer. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about how do you keep going? How are you not tired? I'm, so, I'm 30 this year and I'm so sick of my assertion, confidence um, and general ability to call things out being interchangeable with aggressive, mm -hmm. whingy, um, feminist killjoy, all those kind of things. I mean, I'm. I've had one of those days today where I was on, the, and then I got on the tram, and there were man spreaders, and it was just, you know, <laughs> like, how do you keep going when people c continually call you out and try and shout you down mm -hmm. for just calling out what is, like, like the, some of the older sisters have already said, we're still talking about 30 years later. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm tired too. Um, I think that part of it is having a very good support system and having someone in my life that is that place where I can go and just be myself and not have to be rah, rah, rah. Um, I think part of it is just sheer stubbornness. Just knowing that I am <clears throat> very lucky and that it's a privilege to have a platform and to be able to call out injustice in the small ways that I do. And so that fatigue is a luxury. And I try not to give into it, but I also recognize that I'm human and sometimes I just need to turn it off and I watch The Bachelor. <laughs> you know, I watch junk TV, I, I watch trash ass movies and I don't apologize. And, and sometimes, you know, I write fiction, I do things to just try and restore myself a little bit and I'm not as good about that as I need to be. Um, but you can't always be fighting the good fight. You really can't. And there will be nothing of you left to fight the good fight if you don't take breaks. And so I always just tell anyone in who's engaged in any kind of activism uh, at any level that you have to take care of yourself as much as you take care of the greater good. Do you ever feel the pressure to be, I mean, the expectation that people have mm -hmm. now that you hold this space culturally um, to, I guess, give your views about, you know, some very big uh, social issues. Do you ever feel the pressure of, of, of stepping into that space? Oh, absolutely. All the time. It's exhausting. The pressure is actually worse than anything else because anytime I say something that people disagree with or don't expect me to say, they get very upset. and. I can't control that, you know, I can't control the ideas that people have about who I am or what I should think. Um, so it's challenging, it's very challenging. 
Uh, but I, I allow myself to, as, mo as best I can, I allow myself to be human and to recognize that that pressure is there, but I, do, I don't have to break from it. And I don't have to, I don't have to give people everything they think they deserve from me. I, I just don't. And so I try to remember that as often as I can. Hi, I was um, just thinking about you uh, and everyone enjoying the image of Melania uh, smacking away <laughs> Trump's yes. hand. And maybe it's just my trauma speaking, but I can't, I don't engage with that stuff because I can't help but think the more viral it goes, the more she's going to be punished for it by him. Oh no, she's got his nuts in a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me great comfort to hear yeah. you say that. Uh, yeah, um, no, he, he I, I think about that too, but first of all, don't cry for Melania, okay? Because yeah. <laughs> she's as bad as Ivanka, and she has publicly supported, like, his, she publicly supported his birtherism. She's not innocent, she's not a naive. Um, My question was, sorry, um, uh, how do we hold, how do we ethically hold people account, in particular, um, as well looking at Hillary Clinton, and the concessions, as you say, that she had to make, or that mm -hmm. she has to make living in a patriarchal society. Um, for instance, I don't think she would be running for president if she hadn't stuck up for Bill Clinton in the Monica Lewinsky stuff. So how do we eth ethically engage with, with women in positions of power, considering that they're surrounded by spikes? Very carefully. I mean, you just, you have to be very careful and you have to look at what's at stake, but women aren't, <clears throat> women are not immune from critique. And that is actually, it's anti-feminist to, to believe that we can't critique women. There's plenty to critique about Hillary Clinton. As vocal as I was in my support, I absolutely acknowledge that there are things that we need to look at or we needed to look at. Now it's moot. I mean, just let her enjoy the rest of her life. But, um, you know, accountability matters and I think that is one of the key things that in all this this genre of critiquing feminism, I think what the people are really asking, what I think Jessica Chris, what Jessa Crispin is really getting at in a lot of her book is how do we hold ourselves accountable for our choices in terms of how we consume culture and how we participate in culture? And I think that's a really important question. And one of the ways we hold ourselves accountable is by being honest about the ways in which we fall short. And so we can look at a Melania Trump and have empathy for the fact that she's married to Donald Trump because that must be a fucking horror show. <laughs> um, but we can also say when he was accusing Obama of not having a birth certificate, you stood by him. And you spoke at the Republican National Convention and supported all of his toxic and noxious policies. So you are just as complicit in what's happening now as he is. Um, just, I'm not gonna cry for her. She has a really good prenup. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's all we have the time, time for. I mean, I could talk to you for hours. Um... I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> You are just delightful. Oh my God. I'm gonna tell you guys a little story about this delightful oh young God, woman. Don't. <laughs> I, I was in I was in Melbourne two years ago giving a talk for a uh, conversation with Maxina Beneba Clark, uh, who's incredible. And she asked me a question about representation and how we, black women in Australia can see themselves represented. And I told her to create that representation, and she has. <laughs> That is um, very, very lovely of you to say. Um, earlier when um, I was telling Roxanne that, she said to me, oh, I Googled you, and I just died. I was like, that's just my life. Like, I, I, I mean, where do I go from here? Um, but it's been such a pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure everyone um, enjoyed your insights on just various uh, issues, including Beyonce. Thank you. Um, we do have a signing. I think Roxanne's going to be signing some books, readings um, uh, somewhere, and they have some books that you can purchase and Roxanne will happily sign them for you. So if you could just join me in really giving Roxanne a very, very warm... Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.